Howdy gang, uh, Mike Jones back again with a, uh, another online lecture uh, about the skeletal system. As you can see in the slides uh, behind my face or off to the side of my face or wherever they are when you're looking at them. Uh, let me put this full screen and let's get on with the skeletal system. Okay, uh, skeletal system. So, you, you know, if you've seen the slideshow, you, sh you should really take a look at the, the slideshow. Uh, the first few slides I'm going to go really fast through because they just simply indicate, uh, you know, lists. Lists of what bones are and what do they do and how do they work and this kind of stuff. Uh, the functional kind of aspect of bones. We're going to zip through this pretty quickly because they're right there in front of you. You can print them. You can look at them. You can review them all you want to. I don't need to read this word for word for you, but I do want to emphasize some things about bones and the skeletal system that you need to know. The obvious things, of course, they, the bones of the body provide a support structure. Um, muscles attach to them. Um, of course, there are joints. We're going to get a whole, there's a whole nother section we're going to get into about joints and what joints do. But of course, joints move, allow bones to move around, and they allow you to move around. And then, then later on in a couple of weeks, we get into the muscular system where we talk all about that aspect of it. Um, so, Obviously, they're strong. They're harder than most of the rest of the body tissues. It says they provide points of attachment for muscles. Yes, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll learn more about that. Um, now, the, 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 the last two things are the things that most people don't really associate with the skeletal system, at least not at first blush. Uh, the last one is store inorganic salts. Inorganic salts, uh, especially in, as, the, as far as the skeletal system is concerned, we're really talking about uh, calcium and phosphates. Uh, so calcium phosphate is the, is the inorganic portion, uh, meaning inorganic means that we don't have, as you learned, you know, a month or more ago, it doesn't have carbon and hydrogen in it, right? It has calcium and phosphorus and, and oxygen and some other, uh, other uh, atoms involved in that. Uh, but there's, but they're considered not organic. So they are inorganic salts, and it is a storage system for these salts, which are so important in other reactions in the body. So you have to think of your skeleton as a storehouse of these salts. Um, and then the other thing is, uh, your skeleton produces uh, the blood components, the cellular, uh, or the, what we refer to as the formed elements of blood. That's where all of these these things are made inside your skeletal system, inside a particular portion of the skeletal system called red bone marrow. We'll get to that in a minute. Whoops, I think I went too far. Yes, right. So function, bone function, uh, of course, provides shape to the body, right? We look like humans when you take the skin and the organs and the muscles off, right? The skeleton has the appearance of a human being. And so we drape all this other stuff on it. And, um, it gives us shape. It gives shape to your dog. It gives shape to your cat. It gives shape to, you know, anything that has a skeletal structure to it. A platypus. Whatever. Uh, supports body structures, of course. These things, uh, things are attached to the skeleton. And it's a nice solid framework uh, to hang on to or to protect, as the next thing is, protect structures. Your heart, your lungs are behind this cage, right? You have a rib cage. Um, of course, your skeleton moves. We're going to talk about joints, and that'll be in the next section. Uh, contains all of these inorganic salts, and it stores those inorganic salts, and it makes blood cells, the cells of the blood. Hematopoiesis is the term for that. Support, protection, movement. You can read through uh, all of the different things in terms of supporting, protecting, helping you to move in this list of things. Uh, things I might point out to you, bones of the rib cage provide support for the thoracic. So this part of the body is called the thorax. You, you know that. Inside you have the lungs and heart. And very important blood vessels, the aorta, uh, the inferior and superior vena cavae. Uh, these blood vessels that are extremely important. Not to say that any other blood vessels aren't important, but 
These are extremely important, bringing very large quantities of blood either to the heart or out of the heart. I hinted that this word hematopoiesis, hematopoiesis is the concept that uh, blood cells are formed in the red bone marrow. So blood cell formation, all the blood cells, is called hematopoiesis. Uh, it's produced in the red, red bone marrow. Red bone marrow is predominantly found in flat bones, so your skull, skull bones, uh, sternum, ribs, pelvis, pelvic bones are considered flat bones. Those are the primary areas of red bone marrow. There's also a couple other areas that you should be aware of. And when I say you should be aware of, you should know this because there are likely to be test questions about this. The proximal ends of long bones. So that means the head of the femur uh, or the head of the uh, humerus. That is that's a proximal end of a long bone. Uh, red bone marrow is the source of hematopoiesis, hematopoietic elements. Uh, yellow bone marrow, which is another kind of bone marrow, uh, is mostly fat. And over time, uh, in some of the long bones, red bone marrow is supplanted by yellow bone marrow, uh, which I'm very upset about because that's an age-related change and that really irritates me, but what am I going to do about it? Inorganic salts. I mentioned what they are. Calcium phosphate is probably the most important in the skeletal system. Calcium phosphate is, an, is a compound that we call hydroxyapatite. Uh, but there are other ones. Calcium and phosphate are, are going to be the ones we're going to come back to over and over again. There are other salts that are included in the inorganic salt storage system of the skeletal system, I guess. Uh, magnesium, sodium, potassium, carbonate. Uh, but calcium phosphate are the biggies. Uh, osteoporosis is a condition that results from the loss of bone mineralization. That means you're losing this hard inorganic portion of the skeletal system. And you're going to see the skeleton is not just this hard, crusty inorganic salt called hydroxyapatite. It's also an organic part of the skeletal system. We're going to get into that in great detail. So the skeletal system is really composed of two big things. You have an inorganic, harder component and an organic, softer component. And they get together into specific uh, amounts, and that creates what we call the skeletal system. Uh, these inorganic bits, especially calcium, are monitored and controlled. The amount of calcium that either goes into your skeleton or comes out of your skeleton is very closely monitored and controlled by two hormones that work in opposite ways. And those hormones are down here. Let me get my little pointer. forgot that. Down here, parathyroid hormone produced, thankfully, sometimes physiology works this way, thankfully the parathyroid hormone is produced by the parathyroid gland. Whew. That makes it a little easier. Uh, not so easy on the other side. This thing called calcitonin. Calcitonin is a hormone produced by the thyroid gland. It is one of the thyroid hormones, but not the thyroid hormone you're thinking of that controls uh, metabolism in the body. This one is also produced by the thyroid, uh, but it controls the level of calcium in the blood uh, and thus the level of calcium in the, in the skeletal system. All right, so let's talk about the anatomy of bones first. We'll start, we'll start large. We'll start um, at the macro level. We can categorize the skeletal system by the shapes of bones. Uh, and the, the size, roughly, the shape, and then uh, uh, the bones that are, have so certain similarities. Like, for example, the flat bones. We say the flat bones are more involved in hematopoiesis. Uh, because they have a greater quantity of red bone marrow. So we tend to, you know, lump those together. Oh, the flat bones are the red, the ones with red bone marrow, that sort of thing. So we can categorize them according to structure. What do they look like? How do they develop? And there are two distinct methods of calcification of bone. 
and then function. Are they involved in movement? Are they involved in protection? Are they involved in bone marrow, uh, bone marrow um, production? Whatever. So let's get into that. All right. First, shapes. <laughs> uh, we categorize bones by by shape, right? A long bone is long bone, but a long bone has certain characteristics. It doesn't, you know, when we say long, we mean uh, it has characteristics that uh, that are similar to other bones. Not that necessarily the length of the bone is the same. Right, so you would, so it's easy to say, oh yes, my humerus is a long bone, my femur is a long bone. Sure, I got it, but this is a long bone too. Right, any of the bones in my appendages here are my uh, the phalanges. Right, this is the proximal phalanx, this is the middle phalanx, this is the distal phalanx. Those are long bones as well. They're long and narrow and have expanded ends. Short bones tend to be more, oh, it says cube-like. Okay, we, 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 we say to kind of take some um, poetic license with cube-like. They tend to be, you know, smaller, compact. Uh, so, like the bones of your wrist would be short bones. Uh, sesamoid bones are short bones, like your patella is a sesamoid bone. Flat bones, flat bones have much broader surfaces. Your sternum is a flat bone. Uh, the bone that they have here, uh, this is the temporal bone. That's a flat bone. Most of the skull bones, the cranial skull bones, are flat bones. Your pelvis, uh, ribs are considered flat bones. And then we have, uh, so that, that constitutes most of the body. Then we have this thing called irregular bones. Right, Irregular bones would be considered like, like uh, um, a vertebrae. A vertebrae is an irregular bone because they're they're irregular. They got a funny shape. They got weird things sticking out of them. They're irregular. So here's another picture of sort of general bonology, I guess, uh, to, to to categorize these bones by shape. So here we go: flat bone, typical. Here's a frontal bone. It's up here in your forehead. Your femur is a classic long bone, but don't forget that your phalanges are considered long bones too. Irregular bone, a vertebrae. A short bone, like a tarsal bone, is a good good example of a of a short or a, of a short bone. Wrist bones are considered short bones as well. All right, now we're going to focus now on long bones. It's more specifically on long bones. Long bones have certain features. You need to memorize this list. You need to tattoo it on your, you know, the palm of your hand. Or, uh, no, don't do that because then I'd have to cut your hand off because I, you would be cheating uh, when you're reading your hand. So, anyway, these are all the uh, sort of terms that you need to understand. Because we're going to be, we're going to start to throw these terms around quite freely when we get to, say, bony development or uh, 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 maturation of bone. All right. So the longest part of a long bone is considered its diaphysis. That is considered what you would might call the shaft. Right. The shaft of the bone. We would call that the diaphysis. At either end of a bone. There's an expanded end that's bigger than the middle part of the bone. Uh, that's called the epiphysis. The epiphysis. So, so this end, you know, just in general, this would be considered the epiphysis out here, and here's the epiphysis of the other end of the bone. Now, this is a femur. This is the proximal bone of your thigh, or your thigh bone, if you wanna, if you remember the old song. Uh, and then in between, the epiphysis. Uh, and the diaphysis is a smaller area called the metaphysis. All right, so the meta so you have a metaphysis on either end, um, and that's in between the epiphysis and the diaphysis. Uh, all long bones will have articular cartilage covering the ends of the bone, and articular cartilage will cover the end that is going to make a joint or make an association with another bone. 
So for example, we would say, well, here's epiphyseal plates. We'll get to those in a minute. And we would say, this is the epiphysis. Well, this must be an epiphysis as well. Uh, the problem here is that this, this particular epiphysis, epiphyseal end, is going to form the head of the femur. It's the head of the femur that's going to make an association with the acetabulum of the, uh, of the innominate bone. And that's going to form a joint that we call the hip joint. So articular cartilage is only going to cover that part that's going to form a joint with another bone. So you would see articular cartilage here, but you would not see articular cartilage here. This does not form a joint with another bone, so it has no need for articular cartilage because it is not forming an articulation, which is why it's covered with articular cartilage. Down here, you're going to see these ends, this, these, these things down here called femoral condyles. They are going to be covered with articular cartilage because they're going to make a joint with the tibia. All right, now surrounding the outside of any bone is a, is a, uh, a connective tissue called periosteum. Periosteum closes the bone. It's very, very dense, very closely associated connective tissue. It's not bone, though. It's connective tissue, very closely adherent and connected to the bone. And it, it is actually where tendons attach to bones. We say a muscle, you know, through a tendon attaches to a bone. Well, it really, technically speaking, attaches to the periosteum, which is very closely associated with the bone. So we got to be careful with our, our definitions and distinctions here. Um, we'll, we'll, we're going to really get into compact and spongy bone in just a moment. Uh, but, rough, but generally speaking, you have to think this bone, if it were solid bone all the way through, solid hydroxyapatite all the way through, it would be very strong, but it would be really heavy. And so in a, in a way, in a, in a, uh, a, a way to lighten up your bone is to make it strong where it needs to be strong and then make it lighter, make it airier where you can to save some weight. And so you'll find that, that that's that's the distinction between compact and spongy bone. Now, don't let the spongy word confuse you. It's not like a sponge. I mean, it looks like a sponge. If you take a sponge and look at it, yes, it's got holes, stuff, tunnels and whatnot. But it's not squishy like a sponge. It's still bone. Uh, the trabeculae are the holy parts of spongy bone, I guess, if you want to think of it that way. Medullary cavity. Medullary, so this word medulla or medullary refers to the middle part. And in, in the bones case, we chop into this bone and we can look into it. In that fact, through this part of the slide, we can look inside that bone. And that is the medullary cavity. Inside the medullary cavity, uh, it's hollow. It's going to contain marrow. The shaft will typically contain more yellow marrow. Uh, the medullary cavity toward the uh, epiphyseal ends or toward the especially the proximal end of the femur will have more red bone marrow in it. Uh, the inside of the medullary cavity uh, is lined with, a, with cells and uh, that is called endosteum. And then of course the bone marrow. I mentioned that already. Mostly you're going to see yellow bone marrow on the shaft. You'll see red bone marrow, especially in the femur. You're going to see it up here near the proximal end up in this area. Okay, here's another picture of what that bone looks like. Now this particular bone, this is a humerus we're looking at here. But they've done the same thing. Long bone. So we chop it in half. You can see inside the medullary cavity. There's compact bone around the around the outside or around the edge of the uh, diaphysis. Compact bone is, is more compact. It's stronger. Uh, Uh, I have, actually have a real example of uh, from a cow. This is a cow bone uh, that I picked up some time ago. Uh, and it shows really well, so I'm going to point it to the camera. So right here, what you can see there is this around the outside. That's compact bone. But you can see inside the medullary cavity. 
right? So it's very, very strong. Obviously, there's no support here. There's nothing there. But compact bone does the job around the circumference of the diaphysis to give it supportive strength. Now, when we get closer to the end of the bone, you start to see this show up. So this stuff, that spongy bone, right? Obviously, it's airier. There's holes in it. You can see the trabeculae because that's that's the airy part of it, the trabeculae, the trabecular network. Um, and so this is less supportive, but it gives starts to give strength as you get closer to the end of the bone. You still see the compact bone around the outside. Very, very strong. So that's the literal visible difference between compact bone and compact bone and um, uh, spongy bone. Now this is, I told you, it's not really spongy, but it looks like a sponge. It has that characteristic uh, tunneling and trabeculae, trabecular network. And again, you have an epiphysis here, an epiphysis here. Now, there's a fact that you're going to need to uh, write this down. Again, this is another tattoo that you're going to need. Your body's going to be covered with tattoos by the end of the semester. Two facts here. Long bones grow longer at the ends. So this thing, called an epiphyseal line, is the uh, remnant of where this long bone got longer. So there's a, a you're going to see, we're going to talk a lot about the epiphyseal plate. The epiphyseal plate will, can be found at either end of the bone. And it is the area where a long bone will grow longer at the, uh, that's actually an area that's, that's within the metaphysis. But one epiphysis will grow out in one direction, the other epiphysis grows out in the other direction, and so a long bone grows longer at the ends. However, long bones grow thicker in the middle. They get thicker here. This cortical bone can get thicker and stronger depending on what you're doing. If you, if you decide that you want to start to run today or you're going to start to weight lift and you're going to start to put extra load through the bone, the bone will grow thicker but it grows thicker at the diaphysis. So the summary here is bones get thicker at the diaphysis and they can get thicker throughout life. However, bones grow longer at the epiphyseal plate and they can only grow longer until puberty. Just, just after puberty, there's a, the, the, the start of puberty is the end of your long bones growing longer. We're going to get into that pretty deeply in a moment. So, here's what I just showed you, right? I just, I just had an example of that shoved up to the camera. Compact bone. Compact bone has repeated units. These are cylindrical units, and you're going to see nice pictures of it in just a moment, but they're cylindrical units called osteons. That's a, a word you're going to need to know quite well. Strong, solid. They, these are weight-bearing areas. These resist compression. That's what this thick outer cortex is all about. It's compact bone, or, or sometimes called cortical bone, formed from cylindrical units that are called osteons. We're going to get into that. Spongy bone has uh, a spongy appearance to it, as you know. And it's called trabeculae, that spongy, holy, airy appearance is referred to as trabeculae. Somewhat flexible, yes, it's not quite as solid as compact bone, but it gives, it, it reduces the weight. You have this in flat bones too, and it's a little bit different, uh, but you're going to see on the outside, on the, well, on the inside and outside, this is a skull bone down here. On the inside of it, closest to your brain, it's compact bone. And on the very outside, it's also compact bone. But in between those two outer parts of compact bone is spongy bone in between. All right, compact bone. So I mentioned osteons. This is an osteon. That's cylindrical unit. So uh, get a, 
yeah, you really need to orient yourself to so that you know what you're looking at here. If we, we take this bone, so here's a femur, we've chopped it in half, we've cut part of it open so you can see the intermedullary cavity, uh, then we take a small section of it. Now we're looking at, so this is a vertical direction, just like this is, vertical, up and down. So these cylindrical units run up and down, and the cylindrical units are called osteons. Now in the middle of each osteon, there is going to be a, a kind of a hole, if you will. That hole is called the central canal. The central canal has, uh, as it says, blood vessels and nerves are going to run up and down the osteon. So each osteon is next to another osteon, and that's next to another osteon, and these are all next to each other. In the in the center of each one of those osteons is a is a, a hollowed out space called the central canal. Blood vessels run through there, nerves run through there. Now osteons can also communicate with each other. They communicate through the, with each other through channels that are referred to as perforating canals. So you have these little channels. So they're going to have blood vessels that communicate with another central canal of another osteon, uh, nerves that run through there. Right, so they're all connected to each other through osteons, through these perforating channels that branch away from the central canal. Uh, lamellae, lamellae are the concentric layers, like uh, rings of a tree. So, the, so they have layers, layers upon layers upon layers that the osteon is composed of. Now these are microscopic units. When I look, when I show you this thing, as I just I did a little while ago, this is not an osteon. <laughs> Don't get the idea that this is the center of an osteon. That's not how it works. Osteons are microscopic. You need a microscope to look into the compact bone to see the osteon. And there are millions and millions and millions of osteons all cram-packed together. Each osteon is built in a layered format like the rings of a tree. And so each layer is called a lamella. The center of a lamella is going to have a central canal. As I mentioned, perforating canals will connect one osteon to another osteon to another and to another and to another, so they all communicate with each other. They will share blood vessels back and forth. They'll share nerves back and forth. Um, osteons are built by bone cells. Mature bone cells are called osteocytes. All right, we you know we got to get to the we, we we need to we're going to get into the whole idea of how bones are built and uh, bone building cells and then the mature cells that they become. So the, the the bone building cells are referred to as osteoblasts. So a blast cell is a, is any cell that builds uh, builds a, a structure or it or it forms another kind of cell. It it, it differentiates or matures into another kind of cell. So a blast cell is an early form of a particular cell. In the bone world, an osteoblast is the early cell. Osteoblasts will build bone. They build a bone matrix. They build osteons. Uh, and then they mature. And, be, and uh, as they mature, they change names. And the name goes from osteoblast the bone building cell to an osteocyte, which is a bone maintaining cell. Now, osteoblasts build bone, and then they build a house around them. They build a bony network around. So if you were, it's like if you built a house around you, and then you lived in the house. You didn't move out of the house. You built the house around you, and then you stayed there. So that's what bone cells do. They build the house around them, they build their osteon around them, and then they stay there, they live there. They live in a carved out area, their home. Their home is called a lacunae. But lacunae can connect to other lacunae. So bone cells will communicate, osteocytes will communicate with other osteocytes that built the house right next door. 
and I built that house over here and the house over here. Right? And so there's all these lacunae and the bone cells will send uh, pseudopods out. A pseudopod is an extension of a cell. Uh, pseudopod literally translates into false foot, but it's a foot or a leg. It's an extension of a cell and it's reaching out to another osteocyte. And so these osteocytes will connect to other osteocytes through their uh, pseudopods and the, the, the microscopic tiny little channels, tiny little canals that these osteocytes communicate to other osteocytes, these little channels are called canaliculi. So canaliculi, canaliculi is where one osteocyte will communicate with another osteocyte and another osteocyte. So the osteocytes are connected together too. They're all talking to each other and they can communicate and pass ions back and forth. So this picture is this picture straight out of your book. Again, same process, the same ideas here. First off, let's, let's we start with a bone so that you know what you're looking at. It doesn't matter what bone, but in this case, this is a humerus. We've taken the humerus. Here's the diaphysis, remember the, the middle part of it. We've chopped it open, and now we're just going to look at this little bit of the compact bone structure on the in this part of the diaphysis. Okay, so we expand that out. So here is an osteon, this cylindrical uh, unit of a bone. So here's an osteon here. Next to it is another osteon. And next to that is another osteon. And so you have lots of these osteons all next to each other. But they all run up and down. In the middle is a central canal. And you've got your blood vessels and your nerves running up and down as well. And lymphatics. Lymphatics will also run through here. On the outside is the periosteum. The periosteum has a couple of layers to it. I'm not so concerned that you know those two layers, but the periosteum is on the outside. It's a connective tissue, but it is very, very tightly adhered uh, to the outside of the bone. Right, then not too far a distance in, you start to get the osteons, and they, and they are oriented in a vertical direction. Now you can see how these fibers, how the collagen fibers Remember I mentioned there's an organic part to bone and an inorganic part. The inorganic is mostly the hydroxyapatite that we talked about. The organic part of bone, the organic part of bone is provided by collagen. Now the collagen fibers are oriented in various directions to add strength to the osteon. And then if we further look and we'll see these, these, these things that look like little spiders, <laughs> That's an osteocyte, All right? So this osteocyte is in this lamellae, this circle of the tree ring, tree ring, you could think of them as tree rings, All right? Here's an osteocyte and an osteocyte and an osteocyte and an osteocyte. So all of these osteocytes build the osteon. Remember the osteon can be several millimeters, several centimeters long, maybe even longer. Um, so it requires a lot of cells to maintain that, to build it and maintain it. And each one of those cells then takes up residence in a lacuna. The lacuna is the little home, the little hollow space that the osteocyte makes for itself. And it communicates to the other osteocytes through canaliculi, through these pseudopods, these, these little extensions. Right, so that's why it looks like there's bugs all crawling around here. They're not crawling. They're actually staying still. They're just talking to other osteocytes that are nearby through the canaliculi. So they can, they know it's their neighbors, right? This is, this is their neighborhood. Now on the inside, there is a cell layer, a cell lining, a single cell layer called an endosteum. So this is a structure. This is how bone is made. Compact bone. So compact bone is made strong. So these things are quite vertically strong. Can handle a lot of downward pressure. So here's a microscopic view. It's kind of a false colored view. But this is an osteocyte. 
And you can see lots of extensions coming off. Now, of course, in the preparation of this slide, we had to chop off those pseudopods. Sorry, little osteocyte. We had to do that to you. But this is the osteocyte sitting inside its lacuna. L the lacuna is just this hollow space that it resides in. Canaliculi, uh, as, as you saw in the last slide, is really kind of a better drawing of it. The place where the extensions, the pseudopods from the osteocyte, connect to other osteocytes. Right, so extracellular matrix of bone is largely collagen fibers. So that's the organic part of bone. Inorganic, hydroxyapatite, calcium phosphate. The organic part of bone is mostly collagen. Uh, understand these two points here. Collagen gives the bone resilience. Resilience means it can bend a little bit. It can take a hit. Uh, it, can, it can take a force and bounce back from that. But, Inorganic salts make a bone hard. If you have too much inorganic salt and not enough collagen, the bone is brittle. Too much collagen and not enough inorganic salts, and you've got a very floppy, non-supportive, not very stable bone. You need both in the right quantities. All right, so here's a uh, drawing, a sort of a magnified drawing of endosteum. All right, so we have... Here's an osteocyte and an osteocyte, and now there's these pseudopods, the little feet that are communicating through canaliculi to other osteocytes. Uh, you have uh, a layer around the outside of this. Now they're, they're, they're telling you it's spongy bone here. This layer along in here is called endosteum, in, right next to the medullary cavity, right next to the inside of the bone. That's called endosteum. But you'll see that there are several different cell types here, and we're going to get into why you have these different cell types. So osteocytes, you know, are mature osteoblasts. Now, there's another kind of cell. Uh, uh, well, here's an osteoblast. So an osteoblast, and I've already mentioned how an osteoblast matures. It builds bone. So the B is for build. Osteoblast builds. Osteoblasts mature into osteocytes. So they are related to each other. Their development, their differentiation is related to each other. Osteoblasts come first, they build the bone, they build their house around them, they mature, and they become an osteocyte. Osteoclasts have a different origin. Osteoclasts are cells that, I always like to think of the C as crush bone. Now crushing is kind of, that's the wrong uh, idea. I don't really want you to think that it crushes bone, but it does break down bone. So osteoclasts break down bone. Osteoblasts build up bone. And you need both processes to happen at the same time. These have to happen simultaneously. You can't just build a bone and then um, expect that it's perfect just that way. It has to be uh, altered to fit the circumstances. And that process where osteoblasts build up a bone and osteoclasts kind of uh, scour the bone or tear it down or crush it in my C word, you know, idea. Um, that process is called bone remodeling. M-O-D-E-L-L-I-N-G. Remodeling. So bone is remodeled forever. <laughs> From before you're born till the day you die. Bones are living tissue that are remodeled constantly by these two cell types, osteoblasts and osteoclasts. Here's a close-up of the periosteum. I mentioned it's the, this is the connective tissue that is very tightly adhered to the outer ring, outer aspect of bone, of a, of a long bone in particular. Now, you have periosteal layers on flat bones too, and their association is quite similar. Again, the periosteum is where um, tendons from muscles are going to attach to that bone. And of course, if the tendon attaches to the periosteum, and the periosteum is very tightly adherent to the bone itself, wherever the muscle pulls, it pulls on the periosteum, that's going to make the bone go in that same direction. 
Also recall that I said that periosteum is where a long bone gets thicker. If it's going to get thicker, it's going to get thicker at the periosteum. Again, osteocytes. Here's the pseudopods that are coming off. Little feet going through canaliculi that are communicating with other pseudopods of other osteocytes. So that's mostly long bones, but, but periosteum is, is, is part of flat bones as well. Uh, but here's flat bone anatomy, and I mentioned to you that there's compact bone on either side of a flat bone, and then there is trabecular bone or spongy bone um, in between. So you have a similar arrangement, it's just it's just flat instead of you know round or circular. Same concept. Okay, now we get into the two methods of bony development. When, uh, um, <clears throat> when bones develop, they develop in these two different ways, as you see on the screen. And uh, I've decided I'm going to put that on a different slideshow, but it will be related to this uh, slideshow, a different uh, recording, a different uh, video. So I'm going to post this one, and then we'll do the uh, bone growth and development, and then you'll see these all these factors will come together into one big mushy pile of the skeletal system. I'll see you on the next video. Thanks for your attention.